Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, take your Bibles or your apps or whatever you read on, um, and turn to Malachi chapter 3. Mala what? Malachi. It's in the Old Testament. It's actually towards the end of the Old Testament, so you can, uh, if you know where the beginning of the New Testament is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you can find Matthew, then just back up, and you'll run into Malachi. Um, if you're totally confused at this point and have no idea where to go, um, open your Bible, first few pages in, there's a thing called the table of contents. God gave us that table of contents for a reason, please use it. <laughs> so if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, or you don't have a Bible at home, uh, we've got some Bibles underneath some of the chairs, and we want you to have that. Uh, we want everybody to have a Bible at their house that they can read, that they can refer to, that they can double-check what we're saying from this stage. So feel free to take that Bible home if you don't have one. Um, so today, we're in Malachi chapter 3, um, and our topic today is tithing. Now, we're in this series, Money Talks. Uh, what does it say other than goodbye? Um, but today we're talking about the tithe, and this is an uncomfortable topic. Let me just call it out for what it is. Um, this is not one of those sermons that I uh, get ready for, and I go, man, I can't wait to preach this one. No, this is one of those that I look at and go, man, I wonder what complaining email I'm going to get after I preach this message, because inevitably, any time that we talk about money here at Calvary, we get complaints. It's the one topic that makes people mad at us. Um, we'll not get a complaint for months on end, and then suddenly we talk about money for two minutes, and we will get emails the next day. It happens every time. And I think that Chad addressed this the best last week, so I'm basically going to repeat what he said last week. Um, here's what he said. The biggest complaint we get about this topic is, why don't you just stick to biblical topics? Why do you have to talk about money? Why don't you just talk about what the Bible talks about? That's what we hear. And so let's address that for a second. If you were here last week, don't cheat. But when it comes to the Bible talking about belief, about believing in God or believing in Jesus, the Bible addresses that 272 times. That's a lot of times it talks about it. Uh, what about prayer? Prayer. Prayer's kind of a constant theme in God's word, right? It's kind of a big deal to us as God followers, as Jesus followers. It talks about praying 371 times throughout all of the Bible. That's a lot. What about love? I mean, it's been argued that the Bible is just one massive love story from God to his people. And I think that argument's actually correct. The Bible talks about love 714 times. Now again, don't cheat if you were here last week, but knowing those numbers, belief, prayer, and love, and how many times the Bible talks about those things, how many times do you think that the Bible talks about giving or tithing? Over 2,000. Someone's cheating over here. I, man. Word for word, what Chad said last week. Over 2,000 times that the Bible talks about this. So we at Calvary, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And so if we're going to be faithful to preach what God's word says, we have to talk about this. We have to address this topic um, so let me put in just a really quick disclaimer, though. If you're sitting here and you are not a follower of Christ, okay, you, you do not have a life-changing relationship with Christ, I am so glad you're here, but this message does not apply to you at all. Because the command to tithe is exclusively directed to followers of God. It does not apply to those who do not follow God. So if you're sitting here and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you are welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. But maybe you want to play a video game on your phone while I preach because this message just doesn't apply to you at all. Um, if you want to listen, great. But just understand that this isn't for you. This is for the followers. So let me, before I go any further, let me address the definition of tithing. Because I've been throwing around this word for the last four minutes 
and haven't defined it. And it's a church word, right? I mean, when was the last time you were out in the community talking to a buddy and was like, dude, the tithe this week was awesome. We just, it's a church word, right? Totally in this house, not used outside of this place. Okay, so what is a tithe? A tithe or tithing is the command given by God to his people to give 10% of everything he's given us to go to the works that happen in his church. In other words, the ministry that happens in his church. Okay, so 10% of everything you have that God has blessed you with, you give. So that's the definition. So let's talk about the misconceptions, the things that we hear at Calvary when we talk about tithing or money. Uh, I've already given you one of them. Why can't we just talk about what the Bible talks about? That's one, right? The second one that we hear a lot is, isn't the tithe an Old Testament thing? Didn't Jesus do away with that? Uh, Here's another one. Do I really have to tithe? I mean, really have to tithe? Um, And one that's tied to it that's uh, uh, similar is, well, I tithe my time, so do I have to tithe my money? And and the the last one is my all-time favorite, and, and it's this one. Well, you know, I don't tithe because I don't trust the church and how it spends its money. So I'm just not going to give. So those are the things, if you were to kind of sum up all the things that we hear from people when we address this topic, those are the, the, the statements or the questions that we hear the most. And I want you to notice there is a common thread in all of these questions or statements, and it's this. I want to know what is the bare bones minimum that I have to do to be okay in the eyes of God. Now, I don't know about you, but when I became a follower of Christ, it wasn't about squeezing by just enough to get into the pearly gates, right? That it, God doesn't say, love just enough to make me happy. But once you reach that point, you don't have to love anymore. Is that what God's word says? That forgiveness? Forgiveness is one of those things, you know, you just do like seven times per person and you're good to go. Actually, no, Jesus himself kind of gave us, uh, through a a word analogy, told us to forgive infinitely. So doing enough to just get by just isn't a biblical concept in any realm of spirituality, in any realm of following Christ. So why would we do it with our generosity? Uh, That's one of the questions that I want to look into today. So take your Bibles, I told you to turn to Malachi chapter 3, so take your Bibles, Malachi chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 8, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, and it says this, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you, in tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will the vine of the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. It's a pretty interesting passage, let's be honest, because there are a few things that it says in here that are pretty straightforward, and then there are a few things that you don't really find uh, challenges like this uh, elsewhere in Scripture. So let me address a few of these. First off, it says that we are robbing God, okay? Now, Again, let's go to the idea of being a follower of Christ. As a follower of Christ, is stealing from people or anybody something that God says, yes, do that? No. Let alone robbing from God, right? I mean, if, if God is saying we're stealing from him, we should probably take that pretty seriously because that's some strong language that God's using here. Also, I want you to notice that this is one of the only passages that you'll find in Scripture where God says very clearly, try me, test me on this, 
and see if I won't blow your mind. That's the OC translation. If I won't blow your mind with the overflow of blessings that I will pour into your life, test me here. If you will tithe, if you will test me in this, I will pour so many blessings into your life that it will overflow. Now, Chad addressed it last week. We're not talking necessarily about financial blessings here, though. There are many, many ways where God blesses us, but all too many times I hear people talking about, yeah, you know, I just can't get a leg up financially. Man, my car broke down last week, and it was broke down three weeks before that, and, and this bill came in that we were totally not expecting, and then this thing happened, and we had to pay for this. And I always ask people when they come to me with things like that, well, are you tithing? Because I don't know about you, but if I walk into my house and catch a robber taking money out of my safe and putting it in his pocket, and he looks at me and goes, oh, how embarrassing. I didn't think you were going to be home. Nah, this is crazy. Hey, while you're here, can I borrow a thousand bucks? Am I going to give someone who is stealing from me, caught in the act, am I going to turn around and give him more money? No. But this passage says that that's exactly what we ask God to do. So when we are having a hard time catching up financially, there are usually two culprits. There's either you're just not managing your money well, you know, you're, you're making pretty bad decisions with the way you're spending, or, and or, you're not tithing. And so of course your car's breaking down all the time because God's not blessing you there. And I can attest to this, my mechanic is sitting in this room right now, okay? And I took my little, I've got a little car that we recently got, and it was rattling really, 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 really bad, like troublesome rattling, like the engine was rocking the car kind of rattling. And so I took the, the car to my mechanic, my mechanic explains, listen, Dude, your, the motor mounts on your vehicle are gone. They're completely deteriorated, and it's destroying the engine and the frame of your car. It's going to cost $500 to fix it. And so I go, okay, let me call my wife and talk to her about it. Jana goes, God will provide. And so we took care of paying the mechanic and paying that, and in the last month, God has brought two weddings into my lap, to pay, which has paid completely for the repairs of that car. Unexpected income for an unexpected bill. Hey guys, what I'm talking about here is if you want things to work out financially, you've got to be faithful financially. If you're robbing God, he's not going to honor you financially. And so that's the concept that he throws out here in Malachi chapter 3. So, Let's talk about an explanation of the tithe. Let's give you a little, I want to give you a little background on where this concept comes from, where it came from. So the first thing that we need to understand in the explanation of the tithe is first off, Psalms 24 verse 1 and many other passages throughout the Bible tell us that God owns everything, okay? So your job your retirement account, your bank account, your savings account, your car, your house, your family, your friends, everything you have in your life was given to you on loan by God for his use in our life. Does that make sense? In other words, it's like me loaning you something and saying, this still is owned by me, but I want you to use it uh, because you need it in this time. And so God owns everything. We owe him everything, physically, spiritually, mentally, etc. The first tithe recorded in the Bible is found in the book of Genesis. If you, Genesis is the very first book of the Bible, and in chapter 14 of the book of Genesis, we read about a guy named Abraham. Now, Abraham was this huge uh, man of faith. He, he, he established a lot of what we believe, and God spoke to him and did some amazing things, but specifically in chapter 14, we find that Abraham has gone off to war because a king has come in and invaded these cities taken people captive, and of the people taken captive, some of Abraham's relatives were the ones taken captive. So Abraham goes off, gathers his guys, goes off to war, fights this king, wins, sets the captives free, 
and comes back, and when he comes back, he is ministered to by a guy named Melchizedek. Weird word, do not name your children this. They will get ridiculed. But Melchizedek comes in, and the Bible describes him as a priest to the Most High God, to our God. And he comes in, and he offers sacrifices to God on behalf of Abraham. And he does his priestly pastoral duty to to bless Abraham and help Abraham. So Abraham, in response, gives him 10% of everything he has. And then we find later on that Abraham's kids and grandkids do the exact same thing with those that minister to them. And then we find, if you read the first five books of the Bible, especially Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we find that that act that Abraham began actually becomes a command to God's people. And God says, 10% of everything you take in, everything that you make, 10% of that goes back to my tabernacle for my ministry. Okay, and so that's the Old Testament part, but the question is, what about New Testament? Because we're under the new covenant that's found in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. What about the New Testament? Well, I've given you three passages in your notes. It's Matthew 23, 23, it's Hebrews 7, verses 4 through 10, and 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. All of those passages allude to the fact that we are still called to give 10%. Uh, The one in Matthew, Matthew 23, verse 23, actually uh, is interesting because it's Jesus talking. He's condemning the Pharisees. And in that condemnation, he says, you guys give 10% of everything you have, but you don't love justice and mercy and humility. And he he then goes on to say this, and this is where he backs up what we're talking about today. He goes on to say, don't neglect the first thing. In other words, don't stop tithing, but please start enacting justice and mercy and humility. In other words, Jesus says, it's an expectation of mine to tithe, but don't tithe and forget to do the good spiritual things that you're supposed to be doing as well. They go hand in hand. So the Bible confirms Old and New Testament that we are called to give that 10%. All right, so that's the business end of tithing. Now let's talk about the point of tithing. First, I want you to understand that tithing is trusting. Tithing is trusting. It's, tithing is a trust issue, which means at its base, Tithing is a heart issue deep inside of us. It's trusting the one who gave us everything that we have and trusting that in his command on how to operate what he's given us, that we trust him in that. And so let me give you an illustration. You may notice that there's a, a you know, bar high table over here with a pitcher of water. <laughs> I love my staff. Apparently, I need a step stool as well. So, can everybody see me now? Okay, great. Somebody's backstage laughing at me right now. This is weird. I'm going to put this back. Okay, so back to the illustration. Okay, so for a moment, imagine that you're in the desert, and you've been in the desert for many days, and you are thirsty. And I'm not talking thirsty like, oh, I could use a drink of water. I'm talking thirsty like if you don't get some water, you're going to die, okay? You need some water. And so you're in the desert, Please, we're from Havasu. You guys should be able to wrap your minds around this concept. So we're, you're roaming in the desert. You're in need of some water. And all of a sudden, this guy walks up with a pitcher of water and a glass. And he says, hey, do you need some water? And you say, yeah, please, water. And the guy looks at you and says, great, I've got all this water. And I tell you what, I'm not just going to give you one glass. I'll keep filling this up as you need water. But before you take a drink of this water, I would really appreciate it if you'd put just a little bit off the top back into the pitcher. And here's why. You see, there's a guy in this desert who made this glass so that I could bring it to you and give you water in it. There's also a guy who fills up this pitcher every day so that I can go out and fill people's glasses. And he's in this desert, and he needs water also. 
And then, probably most important, there's a guy that cleans this glass. Because I don't want to give you a dirty, yucky, you know, disease-filled glass of water. I want you to give, get something clean. He's in this desert also, and I want to make sure that he gets enough water to, to do, mini, do this ministry. So I ask that I'll keep filling this glass, but I want you to just put a little bit off the top back in the pitcher. Is that an unreasonable request of the person who gave us the water? Not at all. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I would be very appreciative if I was in that circumstance. The, the fact of the matter is, is that the tithe is designed for ministry, okay? The tithe is about trusting the ministry that God has given us and given the church and saying, I trust you, Lord, to take care of this, and this is one of the ways that I show you that trust. So this brings up one of the statements that I brought up in the very beginning of this message, which is, well, I don't give because I don't trust the church. Well, let me just call it out. First off, I would really hope that because of how we operate and what we do in this community that you would trust Calvary. I'll just call it out for what it is. But maybe you're going, you know what, I still don't really trust. Well, let me give you some reasons to kind of help you trust a little more. I want you to know that there are massive levels of accountability in the way we run our finances. So for instance, I cannot spend a penny of the church's money without that being quadruple checked before it's approved. In other words, there are four levels of accountability that check every single one of my receipts that I spend for or with the church that make sure that the money I'm spending is a godly way to spend money. Isn't that amazing? I mean, to have four people, do I, do I get tempted to steal money from the church? No. Because there's four people checking me, making sure that I don't have the ability to take money from this church. But the cool thing on top of that is that, and we talk about this all the time, 22 cents out of every dollar that's given here at Calvary goes back out into the community and into to the world to meet the needs of, that God has given us in this community and the world. 22 cents. So we ask you to tithe and the church actually double tithes because we value this concept so much. We are the biggest giving Southern Baptist church in the state of Arizona. And we have been for a few years now. So. We hope that that would help you build trust into how we operate and what we do. But maybe you're still going, yeah, I still don't know that I can trust you guys. Well, let me give you two more things that will help you in that. First off, our treasurer here at Calvary makes a statement constantly. I've heard it over and over and over again. The statement is this. At Calvary, we spend the money that you give as if it was God's money because it is God's money. Our treasurer makes that statement constantly. I bet I've heard him say that exact statement half a dozen, if not a dozen times in the last six months. He always says that. That's the philosophy that we have in the way we use the money that you give. But the other side, if you're still not trusting, if you still don't know if you can trust us, is this. If you don't trust Calvary in the way it spends its money, then come check out how we spend our money. You can call the church at any time during office hours and make an appointment with one of our financial team members and we will open up the books for you and let you see how every penny is spent. We have done that for years. We have had an open transparency policy with our finances for years and years and years because we want you to know where the money goes and how it's being spent so that you can trust us. We have nothing at all to hide from you. We are open and transparent with that. So if you don't trust us, come make an appointment and we'll change your mind because we will show you how we're using God's money in his way. So, but ultimately, let's be honest here. Is not tithing, is that a Calvary issue or is that a trusting God issue? It's a trusting God issue. Because God doesn't say in Leviticus 
God doesn't say in Deuteronomy or Numbers or Matthew 23 or anywhere else, God doesn't say, give to the church or the temple as long as you trust them or as long as they're doing ministry the way you would see them do ministry. It says, give 10%, period. It's not about whether you trust us, it's about whether you trust God and his commands. It's about obedience. And so you see, tithing is not giving away, it is giving back. Tithing is not giving away, it's giving back. It's about trusting God and saying, this is what you've given me and all you ask is that I give you back 10% of what you give me. It's saying, I trust you and I give it back. I'm not throwing it in a trash can, I'm giving it back to you for your work, okay? But let me call it out, Chad said it last week, does God need your money? No, God owns everything on the face of the planet. If he wants money, he's got money. Technically, does the church need your money? No, because God's funding the church. So if every single one of us that attend Calvary suddenly stopped giving money to Calvary, God would still find a way for ministry to continue. Ministry would be hindered, but ministry would continue. But here's the thing. It's not so much about ministry happening, it's about ministry being enhanced. Let me give you an illustration. I own a pickup truck, okay? And what's the question that pickup truck owners always get asked? Hey, can I borrow your truck so I can move? Hey, I, I bought a couch at Big Lots. Can, can I borrow your truck to move my couch? I get asked that question all the time. Hey, I, I gotta do this, can I borrow your truck? Sure. But so let's say you have a huge need to borrow my truck. And for one reason or another, just run with me here. Let's say that my truck is the only truck you can borrow. And you need, it's not a want, it's a, you need this truck. And you come to me and you say, hey, can I borrow your truck? I need it. And I say, of course you can borrow my truck. But I do ask two things. First, I ask that you care for it. You know, in other words, I don't want to see you in the newspaper doing donuts in the police parking lot, okay? So I want you to care for my vehicle. And the second requirement that I ask is for, if you drain my gas tank, if you use 30 gallons of gas, I want you to put two gallons back in or three gallons back in. Is that an unreasonable request? No. I mean, if you show up with my truck after borrowing it and you've used an entire tank and it's running on fumes and I don't even have enough to get it to the gas station to fill it back up, that's kind of a cruddy thing on your part, right? Y'all are horrible people. But so if I make, if you make that request of me and all I tell you is treat it well and throw a couple gallons in so that I can get it back to the gas station and fill it up for the next guy that needs it, that's not an unreasonable request, is it? But isn't that what God is asking us? I'm giving you all of the resources that you need to live in this life. And all I ask is that you top off my church, is that you put a little bit into the church to make sure that it can keep running, okay? Again, hear me on this, please. And I know it can be confusing. The church doesn't need your money. But your money, the tithe, enhances and multiplies ministry at his church. And so, think with me for just a minute. Imagine the what if. Imagine for just a second, what if, what if everyone who is a follower of Christ, and let me make that distinction, what if everyone who is a follower of Christ, who attends church around the world, gave 10%? There are a lot of guys out there who have done studies on this. You can actually go home and Google what if the church tithed and dozens of articles will come up and show you statistics and numbers that they've crunched all over the world about how the church would impact the world if the church members tithe. So let me just give you a little glimpse as to what this world would look like if the church tithed. Worldwide, we could completely eradicate the world of starvation, hunger, and preventable diseases. Can you imagine if there was not a person on the face of the planet who starved because the church gave? 
and not another person died of a preventable disease because the church made sure that they got the medical care they needed. The church is already doing that, but the funding's not there to eradicate it, okay? So here's another thing that would happen. The church within 10 years would be able to eliminate illiteracy across the planet. Churches are building schools all over the world, in third world countries, all over the place. They're already doing that, but if the funding was there, we would be able to build a church in every little town, in every third world country, and every child and young adult would have access to education and would not live in illiteracy anymore. 10 years, we would get rid of illiteracy. Think about this, we could solve the world's water problems and sanitation issues. In other words, a year ago, a little over a year ago, we donated, everybody pitched in money here at Calvary, and we built, we dug over a dozen water wells in Mozambique. Amazing situation because we know that there are kids that didn't have access to clean drinking water, and now they do because you guys donated enough money for us to dig a well in these small towns all over Mozambique. But if the church gave the tithe, we would be able to do that in every small town on the face of the planet. And every child on the face of the planet would have access to clean drinking water. We could clean the rivers all over the world. Because we're already doing that, the funding's not there to just completely clean them. We could fully fund all of the mental health needs worldwide. So a person comes in uh, who is in need of some mental health, we would be able to pay and provide that person to see a counselor worldwide. Can you imagine how different this world would look if we could eliminate starvation, we could eliminate illiteracy, we could provide clean drinking water to every person on the planet, and we could provide mental health facilities and people for every person who needed it. Can you imagine what this world would look like? Wow. Now, I realize that that's kind of a big picture, but let me just say one little thing on top of that. All those things would happen, and there would still be somewhere around $100 billion left over for other stuff. $100 billion left over to continue doing good works across the planet. So, again, that's big picture. Let me kind of bring this in smaller picture. What about just Havasu? What about just Calvary? Because you may go, you know what? Yeah, worldwide, that's a little too big to, for my mind to wrap around. But So just think about this church, just Calvary and Lake Havasu City. If every person who is a follower of Christ... So I'm not talking about everybody who comes and sits down here. I'm just talking about those that are followers of Christ who came to Calvary on a regular basis, consider Calvary their home. If every single one of them just gave 10%, that's it. We could more than triple the outreach into the Lake Havasu community. More than triple. So imagine this. If every person who is a follower of Christ who attends Calvary regularly just gave 10%, we could completely solve the facility issues in the school system. We could fix every pipe, every broken wire, paint every room, fix every bus in the school system. No problem, and have money left over. We could completely fund all of the homeless ministries in this town and take care of every single homeless person and all of their needs period, end of story. We could pay the electric bills for people who come to us and need help financially covering rent or electric or whatever. We could cover all of those issues without even thinking twice. We could provide classes on how to get jobs and how to manage your money financially, and we could pay for those classes so that you could take them for free. What would Lake Havasu look like? What if... Everyone just here at Calvary gave 10%. What would Lake Havasu look like? How would it be different if we were giving? This town would change completely in, a, in an amazing way. So here's my challenge to you today. How is God calling you to change the world through your giving? But here's the harder question. 
We all say that we trust God, but does your money say that you trust God? Join me in prayer.